All right, everybody, we're uh, we're going to get started. First of all, I'd like to thank everybody to, for uh, showing up on a beautiful Tuesday night. Uh, I'll first introduce myself. I'm Josh Douglas, and I'm with my good buddy and Bassmaster Elite Series Pro, Seth Fighter. What's happening? Seth just got off of a little pre-fishing deal up. Where were you? St. Lawrence? St. Lawrence, catching some smallmouths. We've both been chasing smallmouth all, all over the place. Some of us northern anglers do, but this one, this one's a title titled "Locating Hard Bottom." This can be spotted bass, smallmouth, or largemouth bass, and all that in between. So, uh, we're gonna get started. All right, we want to first <clears throat> go over this again. Uh, people that have repeat on this deal, we do appreciate that, but. We do have a lot of newcomers, so we, we urge everybody to ask questions. We're going to have a nice, long question and answer segment at the end of our webinar, and uh, we're also going to be giving away some prize packs. Yeah, I love questions, so keep them coming. No such thing as a dumb question. Keep them coming. We'll try to answer as many as we can. There's really not, and that also is what fuels our um, our next webinar, so please please keep them coming. Uh, this is how you go about asking a question here if you're if you're looking at it from your laptop. And this is how you do it if you're doing it from your mobile device. Again, these are Apple products, so I'm maybe a little different with Android devices. But please keep the questions coming all through the webinar. Uh, our, our manager, Breezy, Bree, my beautiful wife, is sitting here taking all the questions, and she'll get them all to us. So please keep them coming all through, and then obviously through the question and answering part of the segment at end. We're gonna for the prize packs. We're gonna pick one person just for being on the live one, and then another one for just one of the questions. It'll be random doesn't matter we're just gonna pick one at random uh, the prize packs are courtesy of these companies right here Biovex Rapala Outcast Tackle and Pelican products and a little order of business before we get going uh, Brent Bishop and Andy Martin you are the winners of our prize pack from our last webinar on locating and catching northern smallmouth bass we'll get an email out to you and get your prize packages your address and all that kind of good stuff and again, in our next webinar, we'll announce the winners from this webinar. So congratulations. Thanks, guys, for uh, tuning in. Uh, I want to thank Lawrence and Navionics. Put together some of these screenshots. Uh, they come off of Lawrence unit and uh, Navionics mapping. So I want to thank them first before we get going. Keys to finding hard bottom. Uh, you want to eliminate the guesswork by knowing what's underneath you. And that starts with mapping. Um, knowing what's underneath you, you can see in this top left photo that I can't, uh, you can't see a point there, but the, the one underneath it, the Navionics map shows that there's a point underneath there. You would never be able to tell by looking at the bank. And the screenshot in the bottom right shows my structure scan image of bait fish, predator fish, rocks, grass, everything you want to catch a bass. Um, the, there's some key key deals going on. You know, you got your map, your sonar, your structure scan, and down scan. And we've had numerous people chime in or send in emails and request that we also we, we get a little bit where we're using more high end equipment when we're out there. Uh, but a lot of our listeners are are having you know more of your entry level equipment, and so it's very important that we try to correlate that in between some of the functions so we will always go back and mention you know this is something that we can do but these are your four key deals and it doesn't matter whether you're Lawrence, hummingbird rain rain it really doesn't matter they all have you know their their form of this kind of um this kind of deal so map and sonar that's the basics right there and then structure scan down scan yeah. breaks it down from there mapping super huge too um it's unbelievable how much time it'll save you you can almost especially with how good the navionics chips are now you can almost just look at them and tell where there's going to be hard bottom without even having to be on the lake or drive over or anything. So that saves you a tremendous amount of time when starting to look for this kind of stuff. Bringing us right into that is is the mapping function. A lot of times uh, when Seth and I hit the water, we can guesstimate high percentage areas simply by looking at the map. I don't know how anyone would do it without it. It's what breathes lives into my, uh, my Lawrence units, and, and it'll tell you a whole lot. Uh, one thing when you're looking at mapping, especially with Navionics, you want to look at different maps. Um, they have nautical charts and they have sonar charts. Nautical charts are the original Navionics mapping that we've all been accustomed to. Sonar charts are relatively new and these are new user contributed data. And in this map, it's kind of hard to fit them both on the screen, but you can see this is Kentucky Lake. And uh, this is the old map in the upper left hand corner. 
If you look at the bars on the left hand side right here, you'll see so much more detail on the one on the bottom right, especially where that secondary creek channel bends off. You can see a little hump that when it was originally scanned, they missed that altogether. And now they have that. And I guarantee you something like that will have hard bottom on it somewhere around it. There's a reason why that is still there and standing. And that would be something worth checking out. So definitely make sure when you look at Navionics maps that you're going between the nautical charts and the sonar charts to see which is giving you the better map. Uh, locating erratic contours. That's how I find a lot of my hard bottom. This is so relative to all kinds of fishing, whether you're talking about big points, um, underwater hidden points like this one here. Or, or even even areas of big grass fields, big giant grass fields, you still want to find where there's some contours. Those are areas that haven't flattened out, that, that'll have some sort of hard bottom, whether that's boulders and rocks, gravel, or even just a, a sandy bottom. In this particular instance, you know, this is a kind of bread and butter right here, something that I would instantly look at on a map and say, there's got to be something off the end of this, this underwater point right here. Yeah, especially when you see that little flat spot out on the end of the point. That's pretty much a dead giveaway for hard bottom. And like I said, it's not anything you can just see right on your map before you even get there. Uh, scanning structure might be pretty elementary to a lot of people, but it's hugely important. Uh, you, I'm still a very big zigzag pattern guy. I go back and forth. I try to keep it as straight as I can in lines until I turn and then get it straight again. And what that does is it allows me to scan this entire thing. You can see here we have a big underwater saddle, two points that meet together. Again, something's got to be there. Something hard's got to be there. And doing that pattern back and forth over that is how a lot of these screenshots are being captured. And that's how you find that little sweet spot in there because a lot of times with finding hard bottom it's it's not so much a big giant area but it's so much of, of a small little little spot on a spot that that's where you're going to get your bite and that's how you find that if you just jumped on this saddle and started fishing you may very well blow right by that or, or miss that cast and never know if there's anything there doing your homework first a lot of these screen captures are captured by doing like an s or a zigzag pattern over your structure uh, traditional sonar. Traditional sonar has been around a long time. Not a whole lot have changed. Uh, finding hard bottom the old-fashioned way. This is actually one that people had brought up to our attention. We're so orientated in using uh, structure scan, down scan, side imaging, down imaging to find rocks. It is, it is, you know, it is awesome. It, it definitely does that. But I, I remember, I know Seth remembers many times, not that many years ago, using this very key right here. To break down and be able to find yeah. your hard bottom with your sonar. This is actually most of the good rock spots I know of on Tonka. I actually found this way, and um, you're essentially just looking for your double echo. Um, you need to set, you need to take your auto depth range off to do this with just your sonar, and then set it. You need to be at least more than double the depth you're looking in. So if you're in uh, 15 feet of water, you need to have your depth range set more than 30 40 feet something like that where it'll show that double echo if you have it set on auto, auto depth range you'll just be looking at the bottom and miss this sometimes you can even get a triple echo it's got to be real yeah. hard the right situation going on but you can see in this picture and i'll go to the next one here's showing that double echo that real hard double echo on the top left and if you look at the bottom right photo that's the exact same shot but i captured it also with my uh, structure scan and you can see all the boulders that are scattered throughout that little spot. Got some grass, it has the ability to blow through the grass and be able to tell that that bottom's real hard. Uh, this is this is new to Lawrence. this is Chirp. Lawrence Chirp actually, I'm, I'm sorry, Chirp's been around for a very long time, saltwater. Uh, Lawrence figured out a way to be able to crunch Chirp into the head of the units without needing a different transducer. Um, at first, I didn't think this was gonna apply to us very much as freshwater fishermen, especially bass fishermen. But here in this screenshot, you can see perfectly how uh, it's the same screenshot. We were using kind of a baiting test, uh, a baiting testing deal here to test it. But uh, here on the bottom, you can see where it looks like just one big fish. Uh, but one thing I noticed about chirp technology with the rants is it gives you a lot better target separation of the bottom and of other fish. And it's actually the exact same screenshot on the right hand side and showing you that there's numerous fish down there. So just something that I really didn't think was going to have much of a, a factor in freshwater fishing, 
and it does. And this is also available in a lot of entry level uh, HDI units. It's not just HDS Touch units that the Gen 3s that have this. It's also in your your regular HDIs. So this is something that a lot of people can can get this kind of technology in a five to seven eight hundred dollar unit. Uh, selecting your sonar palette. I discussed this kind of some stuff in the first one. This goes a lot into finding hard structure. Uh, sonar palette. I use palette 13 a lot when I'm trying to find. This is on the Lorance. I'm not positive what it is on Hummingbird or any of the others, uh, but I'm sure they have something very competitive to it. Um, this this shows you right here hard bottom in and out. It's palette 13. It'll show you the bottom and then green and yellow areas right there are showing that that's a, a shell bed is what this is. It's on a main river bar on the Tennessee River, and that shell bed is sitting there. You can see the down scan image underneath it where the boulders come into play. But Palette 13 shows me a lot of those different kind of deals. Uh, here you can see where it's showing me the rock bottom. Again, on the structure scan, you can see those big boulders, and you see them again on your sonar. So this is another way people in, in more entry-level units can, can um, use it to help find hard bottom. Uh, you don't get so much the double echo deal, though. It's it's kind of showing you the actual rocks. Yep, I agree. A little, little different look at it. Um, if you're going to look for the double echo deal, I recommend the original palette. And uh, if you're looking for, you know, just showing hard bottom on your graph, the palette 13 is a good way to go. And here's another one again. You're looking at this big, this big hump out in the middle of the lake. Uh, something you would have went right over the top of it. It all kind of blends in. Um, here on the bottom to show you on the front side of where the river sitting that deal is exactly where that shell bed's going to sit same deal here i think it's from lake malax so big boulder uh, the boulder kind of blends in with the rest but i mean obviously you can tell by looking at it it's a boulder but here in the, the palette 13 is going to show you that it, that is something very very hard uh we'll get in a structure scan down scan down scan side imaging down imaging whatever your flavor is Here's some structure scan basics just to get things rolling here. Um, your boat engine would be essentially where that top arrow is pointing down. And your freshest reading is going to be everything that's coming from the top of the screen and moving down. Um, with my Lorances, there is no there is no dead area. They, they don't have any dead area. It shoots straight down and off to the sides. So everything to the left is shooting out 60 feet. Everything to the right is shooting out 60 feet. And in the middle right there, we went over a boulder, and you can see we split that boulder dead in half. It's perfect. It doesn't show, you're not missing a single thing. Your oldest reading is going to be down on your bottom. And with Lorance, you can also scan backwards in time if, if you scrolled up to be able to go back and look at something. But yeah. those are the basics of, of uh, side imaging. And that scroll back is a really cool feature. Um, you can actually zigzag a whole rock bar several times and end up scrolling back and you know, kind of picking out the sweet spots, all the stuff it's showing you. Uh, structure scan range settings. Um, I I don't know how about you. I, I use mine between 50 and 80 most of the time. 60 seems to be my favorite number. Um, yeah, essentially it's going to come down to uh, the deeper and flatter that you're scanning, the further range you can run, where uh, the shallower or the steeper the break is the tighter the range you're going to have to run. That's right. And, you know, if you're out on a big flat or on big and you're looking for something in particular, crank rep to 100 or something, anything over that really, I, I, I don't use a whole heck of a lot. Um, I really like that 50, 60 for a lot of stuff up north. I mean, just as a general rule all the way around. In this screenshot, the top one is set at 60. The bottom one's set at 100. I, I tried my damnedest to be able to get on as straight of a line as I could and redo this shot. It doesn't show a whole heck of a lot different, but you can see uh, with the 100, you see more of that rock spine that's coming out in the left-hand corner or the left side of both images. But with the 60, I can also see more shadowing behind the boulders. I can tell how big the boulders are. And for me, it's a little bit, it's more in my casting range. We're talking 60 feet. I got a good correlation. And that is one thing that I want to say, try to find when you're first learning side image and trying to figure out where things are in relation to you and the boat try to stick with a general setting right away and you'll learn in due time what that means to you like me looking at that point i know exactly where i need to cast that bait and to hit the end of that point and and something if you're jumping around a whole lot between 35 and 100 that's going to kind of throw things off and, until you get a little bit more advanced uh 
we talk about pallet setting a lot. Um, I like six for Lorance. I can see everything better. And this, it shows hard bottom spots as white. They come off real white. All these three images right here are the same exact rock pile. Um, one is the first one. I really don't like that one much. It actually looks like it does a reverse and makes the harder stuff darker. Red is okay. The blue setting number nine is probably my second favorite, but all around I like your bottom image of six, and, and I use that one exclusively when I am uh, uh, you know using my structure scan. To me, that gives me the best look. Contrast. Contrast is a big one. Uh, my Lawrence has come stock, ready to rock and roll. A lot of the settings are so good for finding hard bottom and stuff like that. Um, but contrast is the one thing that I change constantly. And the reason why I'm changing is so many things make up why you'd want to change your contrast from bottom composition to uh, water clarity, depth, all those kind of things. In these images, you can see where contrast is set too high. Um, in some of these instances, it's even what the factory settings are going to be. And that's why I'm constantly playing with my contrast. If you look at a lake like Lake Minnetonka, which is a series of dozens of little lakes. Well, they're all different. They're connected. So they all have a different makeup when I go into them. And I'll find myself changing my contrast setting to be able to read my grass lines, my hard bottom areas a lot better. And in this screenshots here, it's two separate screenshots. Both of them, my contrast is set too high. I get the general gist in the bottom one, but you can just tell it's like a photograph. The photo is really, the image is really blown out, real white. I really can't see much, as opposed to the exact same shots with my contrast at more of an ideal setting. Uh, not an auto setting, but, but my setting, uh, what looks better to me. And here I can see, I still get my whites. I can see where, where the harder bottoms are, those transitions. But I can actually see individual boulders. And sometimes that's so key to find that one boulder or a stump on a ledge where, where those fish are just using that as, as a way to break the current. You can see them a whole heck of a lot better. Frequency settings. Uh, frequency settings is something we touched on the last time. I've gotten a lot of emails about that after these webinars. Um, and this frequency setting. I use 455 a bunch still. Um, I use that on like lakes like Lake Minnetonka, more shallow fisheries where I'm, you know, looking mostly 15 feet and under. If I'm at places like Lake Erie, um, Douglas Lake, when I fish there, Chickamauga even when I'm out deep, I, I flip her to 800. And the reason why is this is the same image as I'm going. I just switch it from 455 or maybe the vice versa. Actually, maybe I messed. No, it's 455 and then 800. Um, the bottom shows 800. That's because I flipped the top of the screen over to 800. 455, I can see the entire boulder field all the way across. I can see individual boulders. 800 gives me more of a cleaner picture, what's right underneath me, but starts to kind of dilute as it goes out and lose it. Now, if I was in real deep water, I was only in 10 feet. If I was in 30 plus feet, that would look spectacular, and I'd want to use that all day long. Uh, here's a, just a picture, traditional sonar versus downscan. I don't use downscan a whole heck of a lot. Um, I'm finding ways to use it more. It, I don't think I ever really use downscan on the deck of my boat. It's mostly only while I'm looking over. And here's a good reason why. Um, granted, this is super deep, 91 feet. But you can see on the left-hand side where, I mean, I guess you'd assume that was hard bottom when you went over it. I don't know if I would right away, but on the right-hand side, you can see specifically what the sonar is pinging, and those are some big, giant boulders. Are you a big downscan guy? You use down imaging uh, quite a bit? Not, not a lot. Again, also just on the console. Um, a lot of guys really do like it. Um, basically, for me, um, like telling the difference between like grass and brush is really – like if you're brush pile fishing, it's really nice on the downscan. Um, the rest of the stuff I'm using just uh, straight up 2D sonar for most of it. And and with brush pile fishing, sometimes you can actually see the fish yeah. inside the brush. Which with a down makes scan, you can. <clears throat> Shallow water scanning. Uh, something I didn't do a whole heck of a lot until more recently. I'm starting to really kind of figure that deal out. This is a recent tournament I had. I could catch fish. It was all retaining walls. Everywhere was retaining walls that I that I went to. Hard to tell the difference. You can see I'm only in four and a half feet. But one thing I started to notice on these retaining walls is they have to put rock underneath ret retaining walls.
to keep it from the current eroding the outside the bottom part in well one thing is on steeper brakes they have to put more rock in because when they put it in it wants to fall which makes little areas well and little hard bottom areas and this was the key here where i could actually find key little areas as i was idling around that had a little bit more rock a lot of times it's on your corners and i could predictably go back in and flip jigs in there and start getting the bites on that instead of running the whole entire wall and the one thing that i was noticing was 95 percent of my bites came where there was some sort of a hard bottom a little tiny rock pile a couple of boulders whatever it was that they could sit on and then this this image you can see i'm just scanning back through a through a creek channel i got retaining walls there and every single one of those along those are pointing to little hard spots along that retaining wall and this was just a good shot sometimes i'd go a mile without barely seeing a single one of those and it's like fishing docks or something if you're going to fish that you could jump up on the wrong stretch and just never ever ever get a bite not know why but in this circumstance i could see the reason why i'd get the bites where i was getting them and i could duplicate that across the lake Finding hard bottom and grass. Uh, Seth is probably one of the best grass fishermen that I personally know. And I'm taking a lot of that has to do with finding some some sort of bottom competition. Yeah, it's different. a big deal, especially on your lakes that have a ton of grass. I mean, there's miles of it. And fish are going to key in on certain little spots in there. And most of them are hard bottom spots in the grass. Something you definitely want to look for anytime you're on grass lakes where you have a lot of grass, expansive grass flats. I mean, if you go to lakes that have small amounts of grass anywhere, there's grass is going to be good. But lakes like Minnetonka, where there's thousands of acres of milfoil, finding those key little hard bottom spots in the grass, um, they're just going to be super productive spots. And uh, they're kind of sneaky, too. So if you can find them, you kind of have them to yourself. Well, it's something a lot of guys will miss. When you're looking for grass spots like that, are you does your map help you a whole heck of a lot, or is it just more? Yeah, na na start flipping. The Navionics chip's going to show you where to start looking, and you know it's going to get you real close, and then fire up that side scan and find the sweet, sweet spot. You know the cast on the whole flat, and uh, you know it's going to make you a lot more efficient covering that water. And in this screenshot here, you can actually see a few of the boulders as we're going through a grass flat. Um, just some hidden stuff. Uh, that's the type of area I guarantee you type an all cast jig start flipping around in there and you're going to get a bite same deal subtle rocks on weed lines little hard bottom spots it could be boulders it could be sand gravel all of it is good you can see a little inside turn here on this point on the right hand side you can see the isolated boulder and, and uh, up in the upper part of the screen these kind of deals are just bread and butter you can get a bunch of these if you can find a bunch of these these are guaranteed fish spots you stop you might not catch eight nine ten but you might catch one or two and they're always good ones they just seem to always be a spot that a big fish is going to hold down um you do a lot yeah. of gravel oh, yeah. looking on, on weed line fishing for sure a anywhere the grass and the rocks meet is going to be prime time spot for sure and when, when fishing these areas i can't tell you enough too how important a buoy is I mean, you can idle past this right there and get a feel for right where that, that prime spot is and just throw a buoy 10 feet to the left of it and circle back around. And you know right where your cast is every time, no matter which way the boat's drifting, which way you're moving around, you know where you need to make your cast to cover to cover that area. And this screenshot shows that perfectly right on the edge, a little point coming out, hard bottom, and a nice boulder off to the edge of it. Uh, this is downscan. Using downscan, this is that same hard spot. You know, it missed the boulder. It didn't really see that sitting off to the side, but it definitely grabbed uh, that little point that was sticking out right there. And that's how it would look on a downscan. To me, that looks pretty hard. It shows yeah. me a lot of white echoes right there. Um, but definitely something that once you train your eye, that you can see on on your on your structure scan for sure. Yeah, and hard hard bottoms are pretty much always going to be points and high spots. Just kind of the way erosion works. Um, anytime you see little high spots jump up like that on your graph, pretty good odds you're going to have hard bottom there. That can work with traditional sonar too. Yeah, even, if exactly. you, even if you're just doing the old school way of jumping up on the trolling motor, which there's nothing wrong with that, I do it all the time, and just covering covering water in an area, I think, in the flat there's somewhere there's a school of bass in there. Uh, a lot of times I see it on my sonar before I even get the bite. I see that little drop. might be a half a foot, might be a foot and a half. Or, or raise up, and it's like you can almost spawn a taint, spawn, uh, wrong word. You can almost you, you can almost count on it that you're going to catch a fish, and sometimes it's a it's a school of thirty or forty of them in there. Finding fish on structure, 
that's the fun part. You've done your homework. You're getting out on here. You, you need to, this is the traditional sonar. This is, if you're actually looking for the fish, how often are you actually looking for fish when you're looking for hard bottom areas? Um, a lot, especially in the deeper water. Um, real shallow, you kind of got to fish them. Those are hard to see at that point. But anytime you get out past 15 feet of water, you can really see bass well on your graph. And, um, a lot of, a lot of lakes, especially where they're real deep. I mean, we're not even fishing unless we see them, you know, your ledge type lakes or even deeper smallmouth lakes. You can, you can basically just drive around until you find them and then call your shot basically. And not only that, you'll, you'll see the whole environment. You'll see the bait fish. You'll see a lot of stuff in there. And this shot right here, this is just your traditional sonar shot. Uh, we got a hard rock bottom. You can see the fish. No doubt about it. If, there, if there's white underneath them, it's got that hard echo. We got the greens and yellows. These are good fish. These are ones that I want to catch really, really bad. Uh, when I go over something and I see something like that, and those are active fish. They're not on the bottom. They're, they're, they're biters, you know, and, and that's how you'd see them on a traditional sonar over the top of the rocks. A lot of times doing electronics training, I can't express it enough. If you see white underneath something, if it's not connected to the bottom, that's a fish, you know, and, and as long as you're looking, as long as you're using your mapping and you're, you're using your nose to sniff them out, you're around bass, and, and those are the fish that you need to be able to catch. Uh, bass on structure scan, same type of deal. Here you can see them. You can't see them in the sonar image so good, but you can definitely see them in the structure scan image. I see a boulder that was split in half, and I can see a, several bass that are scattered throughout that picture. Uh, we're only in 10 feet of water, and, and I can see them. There's an environment. And if you can see that many, there's probably yeah. a dozen or so, or two dozen more of them. They're all over the place. You know, yeah. they're hugging to the rocks. You just ain't catching them just right. And these are just ones that were just underneath my boat. You know, I mean, when, once you get off and you're starting to look to the side, you can definitely see bass off to the side. It takes a little bit more of a trained eye. And sometimes even with the trained eye, you just ain't going to see it with all the shadowing from the rock and all that different stuff to be able to tell that there was a fish, you know, 30 feet off to the left of the boat. Uh, but in this situation, these ones are right underneath the boat. And, and I bet you I turn around, do another swoop 20 yards off the other side and get that same kind of image back. And those are the type of areas come tournament time that I want to make sure I'm spending my time and catching those fish. Down scan, same deal with down scan. This is one of those we talked about this a little bit in our last webinar on smallmouth fishing. Transition lines can be hugely important. Uh, sometimes it's not just about the rocks uh, or that hard bottom area, it's about that transition line. And here you can see kind of an edge of a of a of a little rock transition. And they are like literally right where they're supposed to be, right where Bassmaster Magazine tells you they should be, and yeah. right where they are. And they're, they're sitting right on that edge, right where the big boulders break off into that sand. And you can see them in the structure scan there in the middle of your screen, right in here. And then you can also see them on the down scan right over there. You can actually see those fish holding up just off the rocks. And that's what that's structure scan compared to down scan. Again, I could see them on my structure scan. But sometimes it's nice just to see it on that down scan too. One one other thing I want to say real quick that I do use down scan for a bunch. I remember fishing on Falcon Lake down in South Texas, and we were fishing old foundations. The water was real high, and there was some old foundations. And I could use the down scan to tell me how high those foundations were. And same in this instance, how big them boulders are and stuff like that. Sometimes I'll use that just to kind of get an idea of what it is I'm looking at. And a lot of times with those foundations was you know, three quarters of that foundation was still relatively square, but one side was real crumbled in and that side had more mixed, you know, I guess it would be rock or whatever it was that the foundation was made out of. And that little rough spots is where those fish would really like to hang out. And you can, on down scan, you can see that a whole heck of a lot better than you can on structure scan. On structure scan, they look like big boxes, you know, they pop out, you want to use that to find them and then just kind of do your due diligence when you go over the top. Rock, pile, tackle. There's two ways to do it, power fishing and finesse fishing. Yeah. Sometimes you need to do both. Yeah, definitely got to do both. But uh, I'm going to start out with power fishing. Um, two pretty basic rigs I'm using. And uh, there's not only are they good rigs for catching fish, they're also um, let me feel that bottom really good, um, tell what I'm on, tell uh, the size of the stuff that's going on. And it's going to be a big football jig and a crankbait um definitely good both deep water options 
and also baits that'll tell me a lot about what's down there about um if i'm on the rock or off of it or the size of the rock um just great baits for covering water when the fish get out deep schooled up um running through my setups a little bit i like really long rods when i'm fishing deep mostly eight foot rods um we're making long casts of these rock piles uh you gotta set the hook move a ton of line get a good hook set on these fish and get them in the boat so um both the rods are a 7 11 and an 8 foot steez um for my football jig throwing that on suffix floral carbon i use a faster gear ratio on my uh football jigs carolina rigs worms stuff that i'm dragging just because uh a lot of times when you set the hook on these big fish out deep the first thing they want to do is come up and jump so um a high speed gear ratio when you're using bottom dragging baits is key and i'm throwing a outcast football jig half ounce three quarter ounce depending on depth um the shallower stuff you know um eight to 12 13 feet i'm throwing a half ounce anything close to 15 or deeper i'm throwing three quarter ounce and then uh the other is cranking that's a great way to cover a ton of water especially on these some of these rock structures are you know fairly sizable maybe more than a couple casts could cover so going through there the crankbait's a good way to cover a ton of water and you actually get some of your bigger biggest fish on a crankbait out of these schools um 7-eleven medium heavy moderate um a little heavy for most cranking but this deep cranking you got a ton of line out there we're throwing big plugs they pull a lot um it's nice to have a little heavier rod for that but still the moderate action to keep them pinned up on the treble hooks uh go down to a six to three just because you're trying to wind this big plug and it pulls a lot seven to three it kind of wears you out um i do throw a 12 pound you can get a little more depth out of 10 but i'm grinding that thing into the bottom as hard as i can so and with the zebra mussels and the rocks you're coming over 10 gets chewed up pretty good and uh my two favorite crankbaits for covering deep rocks are going to be Rappel at DT-16 and a new bait coming out at ICAST, a Storm Mirashi 18. It's already caught several fish in Elite Series events. I think Paul Nick hammered them pretty good out at Havasu on that, and uh, I caught some fish on Kentucky Lake on that bait. But those are kind of my two setups for power fishing. You know, when these fish first get out on the rocks, they're easy to catch. Um, these two baits are going to be put some really big fish in your boat for you. And then... Uh, you know, once they've been on the rocks a little bit, they've been beat up and seen a lot of things, and that's what Josh is going to get into, kind of the more finessey stuff after those fish have seen some pressure out there. Right on. And there's a lot of stuff in between here, too. Like a Carolina rig might be one of the yeah, best. real good bait uh, for feeling bottom. Real good, real good kind of, and, and nothing gets eaten like a, yeah. a weightless Senko does. And so you get to give them kind of that, that weightless presentation behind it. Uh, beef up your weight, chuck it out there. You want it to get to the bottom. And uh, water clarity, mm -hmm. a lot of times you want to switch it. Three quarter, one ounce. On Definitely, the you, you feel it, feel the bottom better. You get it down there right away. Um, Seth covered some power fishing stuff. Sometimes you need to go with more of a finesse presentation. Maybe sometimes even after. I'm, a lot of times, you know, on Tennessee River, I might have even started with a finesse presentation just to get one to bite, and then instantly went to the crankbait or something. Once you get that school fired up. Other times, you know, you start with that football jig and you finish on a drop shot. You know, it just kind of all depends. Uh, both of these are spinning presentations. One's a one's a, a northern tried and true. On your right hand side, that's a jig worm. Uh, the other ones is a drop shot. And these baits will catch fish all across the entire country. Uh, a little bit with my setup, um, I, I custom build my rods. I use MHX blanks for my uh, drop shot rod. I'm using a six nine MHX rod. It's a three power. Or I'm sorry, I'm going to flip that around. The pictures are actually backwards. My fault. Um, for my drop shot, I'm using a 610 MHX DS822 with the new Daiwa Exist 3012H. That was a bad reel, man. I got to tell you, I waited a long time uh, for this reel to come out. I'm very excited to join the Daiwa team. They got some of the best spinning rod. I've been putting these spinning reels to the, to the test. Drags like none other. And uh, this one backs it up. Um, I'm using that that DS822 drop shot rod is perfect, 610 in length. And uh, I'm using 17 pound suffix braid. Some of us got a little mistake and we were crunching here towards the end of the day after long drives back home. But on that drop shot, one of my favorite baits, uh, more in the midsummer, is that three inch BioVex Colt stick. It's, it's ribbed, it's that perfect size. It's still that small profile, but it's ribbed, so it still moves and disperses a lot of water under there. It's got Tiny little air bubbles that actually release just a little bit of natural bubble type action to it. And that bait just gets 
bit. I don't know what it is about it that bait gets bitten. The other one is my, uh, I'm using a 6.9 SJ813 MHX rod. A little bit more of a beef stick. I'm using those American Tackle microwave guides. They're very accurate. Uh, they cast longer. Really like them. Um, Here's another Daiwa reel, a 3000. It's got a little bit, a little beefier reel. Can handle some of that, that uh, bigger weeds and stuff like that that's going to be down there. I actually, when I'm throwing a jig worm, I, I, I want to collect some weeds. I want to get it in the weeds rip it out of there if, if they don't bite it right away a lot of times you rip it out of there and it's a knee-jerk reaction they're going to jump on it and i'm using a eighth ounce this is a good all-around size outcast money jig uh, and in this particular picture it's a five inch sink going a lot of times what i'm going to do on this presentation is find right where them rocks and grass all meet together and i'm going to toss it right in there you know if, if, if i put that buoy out that's right where i want that cast to go right on that sweet spot throw it in there and and that'll catch them every time. Yeah, that jig worm, that's Minnesota bread and butter, and it works everywhere, and we don't know who Ned is. Never heard of him. <laughs> All right, man, that's that's it. We're going to turn it over to questions. We tried the last time we went about two hours. We tried to keep it, throw a lot of information at you to try to entice some questions to come over. Um, and, again, please keep stuff coming. If, if any of this you want more information on, Send us emails, get in touch with us on social media, and we'll definitely break it down more and, and get into it. Please contact us. Uh, our next webinar is we are both got very hectic tournament schedules coming up, and we're going to be traveling around quite a bit. So our next one is going to be on uh, Tuesday, August 18th. We're going to fit one in, smack dab between two tournaments, and uh, it's going to be on finding bass in the grass. Something I think gonna be a good loves. one. That's one of our favorite ways to catch them, man. As a matter of fact, I believe we're both gonna be living in Florida just so we can chase bass in the grass this that's winter. Right. That's, that's how right. much we love that stuff. So, uh, <clears throat> you, you, all of our webinars are recorded. Um, you can catch them right here at my you, my Josh Douglas Fishing YouTube handle. Uh, Seth Fighter's got a website coming out that all this stuff will be on. Uh, what's the website name? SethFighterFishing.com. Imagine that. And you can be able to, well, I obviously have a library of all of these, and this one will, this one should be up there here in the next couple yeah. of days. Yeah, and check us out on Facebook, Instagram, whatever, Josh Douglas, Seth Fighter. Um, if you have any questions after this uh, webinar that we didn't get to or anything, feel free to hit us up on any of those sites or email us directly. Uh, and just real quick, I want to thank these people down on the bottom, these companies. They support both Seth and I in this webinar. Uh, through a lot of different means and sharing it to get it all out. Everybody, that's Psycho Bass Monkey. That dude's the real deal. Big fan of him. BassEast.com, North American Fisherman, Dr. Sonar. I learned all my sonar stuff from him uh, years ago when, when I was green trying to, trying to learn all this, and I still lean on him to this day to learn some stuff in classic bass. Now we're going to turn it over. We appreciate everybody for coming, but please stick around for questions and keep them coming. First question. Uh, from Ron, I have a Humbird units. The red green palette is one way to see hard bottom with the red highlights indicating hard bottom. Is that true? Um, that is a good palette. I still prefer the original one, it gives me a lot better picture. Um, the palette, the, the hard bottom does pop really well on the red and green palette, but you can't really see a lot of what's going on other than what's hard and what's not. So, uh, that is true, but I prefer the original palette. Uh, Robert asked, I've watched a number of these Navionics sponsored webinars. I'm curious how many folks typically are online for a typical session. I'm not sure about all the rest of them. I know uh, Brandon Pownick put up the mark. We're all trying to beat. We're getting dang close. We, Our first one right now, we're roughly around 180 attendees. Uh, we had about 200 last time and and 300 in the winter, our last one for winter. So uh, we have a lot of attendees, and I think we're at a couple thousand on the recorded one. So. We do appreciate everybody who log on live, and, and we'll definitely have the recorded versions too. They're as equally important. Yep. Then Reed asks, what techniques do you use to find rock piles and thick weeds such as milfoil? Um, honestly, when, once the milfoil is grown up really thick to where the point where uh, a good flipping bite occurs, you, you're really not going to be able to see hard bottom. This is I think we mentioned this in our first webinar. A really awesome way to do this Um especially in the north country anywhere uh i mean grass doesn't really grow that well during the winter months so if you can get on these northern lakes right after the right after ice out it's before bass season for most of us anyways and spend a ton of time out there side scanning the grass hasn't really grown up but you know the grass is going to grow out to 
8, 10, 12, 15 feet, depending on what lake you're on. Do your side scan, and then when the grass isn't up, if you find some rocks and eight feet of water in a lake where, you know, milfoil tops out and 10 feet of water in the summer, that's going to be a really prime spot, and uh, that's definitely the time of year to do it. Once the milfoil is super grown up, it's just it, it gets to be too hard to read through. Right, and one thing you can do too, like in Minnesota, Michigan, a lot of places where the season's closed, you can't actually fish. I've taken like a wood of Carolina rig, but just cut off all the business ends, so it's just a weight and like a big one ounce tungsten weight, and just chuck that around, and I can feel the bottom. And the old DNR likes it when they pull up on you and you show them that all you have on is a weight, and they they think you're pretty legit. So uh, Honduras asks, how do you change the depth colors on your nav chip? I had trouble adjusting it when I changed the depth to 15 what i wanted i wanted shallow water under 15 not white but blue yeah i do this quite a bit actually on, on my lorance and that is your uh your depth contour highlight um to do that if let's say you're catching fish on a weed line between 15 and 18 feet or between 8 and 10 let's say whatever it is you would want to change you'd want to set your minimum setting to 8 your maximum setting at 10 that'll change 8 to 10 white and every, make everything else blue. It'll give you that one strip throughout the entire map where you can find stuff in that depth range. Bear with us, sorry. What key things do you look for, Brian asks, what key things do you look for in real shallow water with little contour difference in regards to maps? That is, well, if it does, if you don't see a whole heck of a lot of contour difference, um, I, a lot of times I'm going to avoid it right away. I'm, I'm going to look for things that have more of a contour difference in them, if, if, as long as your map is accurate. And, you know, all these map companies have millions of maps. So they're not, you know, you got to kind of switch and go back and forth. Uh, flip on your structure scan, go through it, see if you see anything different. If it's not, if you're not seeing a whole heck of a lot of contour, Seth, or any changes oh. in the grass. Yeah, um, at that at that point, I mean, if you're talking really shallow, like uh, Mississippi River stuff, um, just pay really close attention to your depth finder. Um, you get on some of them lakes where everything's super shallow, like three foot or less. Um, I mean, those contours aren't really going to pop to you, anyone on the map, but there's little tiny like six inch rises and drops. And if you're on a really flat, really shallow body of water, those can be really key. So keep an eye on your sonar uh, when you're moving around. David asks, what does a shell bottom look like in black and white? And I'm assuming you're talking about black and white sonar. Yeah. Um, again, you're going to want to look for a double echo. Yeah, when you double get to echo. That and you'll actually, like, um, your bottom will be kind of smooth all the way through. It'll get a little rough when you get on those shells. But um, that, that double echo is going to be your, your key giveaway for looking for shell on black and white. Uh, Kenny's asking, I see you have 200 kilohertz. Is that what you always use? It is. I'm always on 200 kilohertz when it comes to my sonar. That's what I read the best on. That's what I've always used. Uh, Lawrence has, in my opinion, the best sonar out there, and 200 kilohertz is what I'm, I'm running. Uh, yes, there is a pallet. Charles is asking, is there a pallet 13 on HDS 10 Gen 2? Yes, there is. I've used it for uh, quite a while now, so I'm almost positive it has a pallet 13 from the, the Gen 2. Them. And Andy asks, can you waypoint and scroll back? Uh, yes, you can. That's actually how I prefer to do it, especially um, another thing we didn't go into. Um, a lot of the rock structures will run almost kind of in lines or like little ridges or something. And what I'll do um, when I'm scrolling back through there, I'll put a waypoint on each end of the structure. If it's in a straight line like that, a little ridge or something, that way you can come back and uh, Use your course extension to line up perfectly on it when you're pulling back up to it. And then just make that one big, long cast perfectly with a, you know, a football jig, Carolina rig crankbait, something you can cover that whole structure with and come right down it. And you'll, you'll know pretty much immediately if uh, you got fish on there or not. Uh, Luke's asking why 4, 455 kilohertz instead of 800 kilohertz. Uh, we touched on that a minute. I'm not sure if this question came in before or after, but just to touch on it again real quick, I use 800 kilohertz a lot when I am dealing with uh, wide open deep water fishing. It's going to give me a lot better detail in deep water. Uh, you can see single boulders all the way throughout the screen. My 455 is a little better. Um, my 455 is better, again, when I'm around 
areas with dry ice, shallow fishing under 15 feet. I really like that that 455 to see a better picture. Good. Daryl, I asked you to find deep water as what depth. Um, when you're going into your sonar and setting it up, anything we do fresh water is going to be considered shallow water in your settings just because um, – a lot of these graphs are made for salt water too, and uh, you know they consider deep water like 800 feet. So everything for us is going to be shallow water. Um, but in my eyes, like fishing for bass, um, I'm can, I'm calling deep water anything you know, 12, 13 plus, out to 30. We really don't fish much deeper than that at all. Uh, 200 kilohertz or 83 on your hummingbirds. Uh, running both, same deal, depth-wise, um, shallower water and deep water. Uh, Aaron asked, recently on a particular lake, I've been seeing a similar image on my structure scan. It has been visible in a lot of my go-to spots. It has been in 12 to 15 feet of water and close to hard bottom weed transition areas. They appear to be very consistent pattern and fairly large. It does not look like gravel, but more interverted. Is it possibly panfish spawning beds? That is um, yeah, point. you can definitely see bluegill beds I on the side scan for too. sure. Um, if you're getting anywhere, you're seeing like that honeycomb pattern. Yeah. Those are actually uh, bluegill beds. Um, another thing, bluegills will spawn all summer once the water gets to a certain temperature, uh, generally around the full moons. But any anytime, you know, the water's 70 plus all the way through the fall and you get a good moon, bluegills are spawning. And, uh, yeah, that honeycomb thing you're seeing on your side scan, that is definitely bluegill beds and a great great place to fish around on uh, on full moons. Um, the bass get up there and kind of get their revenge on them, easy meal for them. Um, great place to look when the bluegills are spawning. And that's another thing, too, just like, the, yeah, exactly, just like how the bass do attack uh, the shallow ones you can see, they're definitely yep. around those deep ones. Yeah, and there's a lot of bluegills spawning way deeper. I mean, you see a lot on like those. Sometimes. Oh yeah, you see a lot on those inside grass line type spots. But um, there's definitely bluegill spawning out into 20 feet plus. You I mean, take that old cast jig worm, you throw that deal on there, and a bass will jump in there and bite that almost every single time. So yes, and you even said honeycomb, uh, Aaron. That's probably what that is. And if you if you'd like, take a screenshot and email it to one of us. And we'll take a look at it and see if we can help you dissect what that is. Uh, Rodney, do you not use down scan to really zone in on smaller schools of fish on ledges and such? Rodney, that's a good question, and I do. That's why I wanted to show you that one, uh, that the screenshots of down scan. When I'm ledge fishing, Tennessee River, stuff like that, I do. I always have my side imaging a little more than three-quarters of my full page and then just a sliver of down scan to be able to pick out stuff like that so yes yeah. i do use down scan as a tool it's, it's always there it, it is a great way to see fish under the boat the one reason i use 2d sonar over down scan up front though um especially when i'm drop shotting fish i can actually see my bait a lot better on 2d sonar I, I can't really pick it up on down scan it shows me the fish good the structure good what they're sitting on but if i'm actually trying to drop to a specific fish i see on the graph i actually prefer 2d sonar Daryl, I asked real quick, would I email, please email these slides to you? Um, I'd be happy to. Let me know what slides you want. It'd be a big file. Again, remember that this will be recorded and up on YouTube, as with our last two previous and all the ones going further. But if there's specific slides that you want uh, to use for your own seminars, whatever it is that you want to use, by all means, please just send me an email which ones you want, and I'll do my best to get them over to you in a timely fashion. Okay. Jason asks, are you able to find rocks or isolated boulders in large flats that are matted over like Gunnersville in the fall? Um, that's going to be like kind of that same deal. Um, I mean, if you can get there in the winter and find those rocks in that shallower water before the grass grows up, it's going to be really good. Um, other than that, you're pretty much, I mean, you're almost limited to going back to 2D sonar and going for a double echo once the grass gets matted up. There's just... No other way you can read through it. Especially if it's real mad and sometimes you just got to, you know, if it's real tough, real, sometimes you just got to tie a frog on it and flip a stick and just go fishing, you know. Um, Aaron asks, if you find a rock pile in the spring at four to five feet of water in a large shallow flat, could it still hold fish in midsummer if it has grass all over it? Or is that too shallow? Um, Heck yeah, man. Yeah. Any, any, anywhere I've been, um, you're – no matter what time of year, no matter where you are in the country, there's always going to be a population of shallow fish. 
and always going to be a population of deep fish. So, um, yeah, if you, anytime you can find, uh, especially in a lot of this hard bottom stuff we're referring to is in lakes that doesn't have a ton of rock, you know, there's some reservoirs you go to down south that like the entire lake's rock. Um, this is mostly geared toward natural lakes, um, or any lakes that don't have a ton of rock in them. When you find hard bottom, that's going to be a really key area for fish to feed on and hide around. So definitely can be fishing four feet of water in the summer. Uh, Ron says, please use your arrow pointer as you are pointing out features. And thank you for that, Ron. I, yeah. That's something I didn't know if it, if it translated to you all. I, I guess I should have in, in the recording factor. I didn't want to bank on it. And then another few thousand people not be able to know what I'm talking about by pointing out that way. But yes, that's a very good point. We tried to use the arrows as much as possible, but we will definitely do better about it. Uh, we're still learning as we go too, so yeah. thank you for that. We will we'll, definitely use better. We'll get on stuff. it, Ron. We, we got you, Ron. <laughs> it's a work in progress. They get better each time. Uh, what do fish look on side scan? I think we pointed some of that out. Kind of hard to go back, but a yeah. lot of times you'll you'll be able to tell it's like a white speck or it's just a little speck on there. And depending on how high up they are, you'll see you'll see a, a shadow. So let's say they're three feet out the bottom, the shadow will be like right next to them. If they're ten, twelve feet up, the shadow will be you know, 10, 12 feet out on your scan. Okay, this is where we're at. Yeah. Um, Andy asks, weight size for Carolina rig, say in 20 plus feet of water. Um, Carolina rig, I always like to fish pretty heavy, like three quarter ounce is pretty much my bread and butter. And uh, I will go up to an ounce if conditions call for deeper water, or heavy winds, current, stuff like that. Steve is asking, is, does the sensitivity setting take any effect in finding the hard spots on the graph? I touched on the fact that it definitely does in structure scan. It helps you give it a cleaner image. Again, my sonar, I really don't mess with much. The only time I take my sonar out of auto these days is to, if I'm like Great Lakes fishing and I'm actually getting a little bit picky with the bass that I want to want to hit, I can tell by slowing down my ping setting and diluting my graph a little bit weaning it down how big a fish is by how big of an echo i get coming back okay zach asks is there a depth where you would ignore hard bottom is there such thing as too deep to be effective say on northern natural lakes like lake minnetonka uh definitely we get a pretty hard thermal climb in the summer up north here um you're gonna want to pay attention to that you're just you're not going to catch any fish below that um and the tonka bite is in my eyes, I'm seeing it getting deeper every year because uh, we have zebra mussels now. The water's getting clearer. Grass is growing out deeper. Um, I don't know what effect it'll have on the thermal climb, but, um, you know, I, I, I would say on Tonka, I, I've never caught a bass more than, and these are small mouth that I've caught out to like 22, 23, but a large mouth. I've probably never caught one deeper than 18, 19 feet on Tonka, so yeah, that hard bottom you're seeing out there in 30, 40 feet of water, you you can pretty much ride out or ride off. Uh, I'm going to take this question. This is from a, a buddy of mine, Rob. I can already tell because I went on a, a guided trip with him, and I made him listen to rap music the entire time because smallmouth definitely like rap music yeah, more so than they like anything else. Smallmouth like rap. So sure. his question is, is it easier making a living slanging bass or slanging bird? Excellent presentation. Uh I appreciate that, man. We had to, we didn't know what it meant, so we had to look it all up. And uh, it's definitely easier make, making a living uh, slinging bass for sure. Less jail time. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> How do you find a thermal client on your Lowrance unit? You know, it actually shows pretty. Really good, yeah, actually. Yeah, really good. Yeah. You, you can see them really, really, really good. It'll come off as a, it'll come off as like a, a cloudy area. Yeah, you'll, get a, you'll get a solid line on your graph. Um you know, depending on the lake you're in, it's going to be somewhere between 20 and who knows, 70, 80 feet of water, depending on the body of water. But yeah, you can see it. It almost looks like a like a cloud of bait fish, like a line of uh, bait fish all the way across there, but it'll be flat and steady all at the same depth. Um, and you definitely want to concentrate your efforts at that level and shallower. Uh, Andy just chimed in that largemouth like bluegrass. So large, we'll large mouth, that in mind. largemouth do prefer country music. <laughs> Small mouth, they're uh, they're definitely on the rap kick. It's just I I don't know how else to say it. Thanks guys, appreciate the feedback, Zach. Thank you. Uh, how much am I depending on spotlight scan? You know, I'll, I'll tell you something. I 
Spotlight scan's awesome, just like a uh, Humminbird version of 360. I uh, really like Spotlight scan. I used it a ton when I was living on Chickamauga in the Tennessee River, and I was fishing around like bridges and stuff, you know, especially in the Alabama rig days when you'd have giant schools of shad around bridges and stuff, and you could literally scan through there and find that where that bass was was splitting the school. Just like you see on National Geographic when the sharks are going after the tuna or whatever it is, where they're splitting it where they're splitting it in half and I could find that cast and may I knew right where it was with spotlight scan. So definitely like it. Plus I like that big transducer up front and it's got all, all the things that I need built right into one. Um, this question is if I had one lure to fish deep rock slash slam flat with, what would you guys choose? You get one, I get one. <clears throat> um, if you gave me one, I'd probably pick a drop shot just because you can catch pretty much every fish out deep on it. Um, don't get me wrong, I like catching them on a big plug and on a football jig, but when times get tough, uh, it's hard to beat a drop shot. Mine's definitely a roller jig or a football jig. I've always been obsessed with jigs all the way around, and uh, I remember when I was pretty green, watched Mike McClellan back in the day just jacking them off of uh, ledges and rock piles with a big football jig, and I've been obsessed with it ever, ever since. So big roller jig guy. Uh, all right guys that's going to be it for now we got a, maybe a couple questions coming in still but we uh we're going to save some of these for the for the next time uh, appreciate you all coming out yeah thanks guys for tuning in appreciate you watching we'll keep these coming and try to pass out as much good info as we can august 18th grass yeah, fishing find a bass in the grass if you uh if you fish talk or any lakes like that be sure to tune in there's gonna be a lot of a lot of secrets going out in that one we're liking it. All right, guys, take it easy. See ya. Cheers.